Hey everyone, welcome back to our video tutorial series on making Snow Fortress Rush. This is going to be a Unity tutorial series about making a game using generative AI such as ChatGPT. Over the last few episodes, we've created some of the basics in Snow Fortress Rush. And um, this is a game where you can control a little snowman um, and be able to uh, attack a village and uh, snow forts protecting the village. The game is sort of a companion to Snow Fortress 2, which is our VR game that we recently released on uh, Steam VR, Quest, and Pico platforms. Today, we're going to take a look at some more features for the game and start to add some more uh, actual gameplay elements. Uh, one thing that we can start off with that's very simple is adding the throwing animation. So you can see that as I throw snowballs, there's no animation on the on the snowman. There's an animation for walking, there's an idle animation, uh, but nothing for throwing snowballs. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first thing we want to do is find out what the animation uh, setup is so that we can tell the AI um, what are the elements of our animation system. Um, so here we've got our layers and our parameters. We have an animation called cast snowball. Uh, and we also have a parameter called attack here, which is a Boolean. Um, so what we can do is um, explain this to the AI. Let's open up our snowball thrower script. And in this case, we're going to try something different than ChatGPT. This time we're going to try using uh, GitHub Copilot. Now, GitHub Copilot is a another um, AI system that's similar, but it's designed specifically for code. And it is also uh, able to be integrated inside an IDE such as Visual Studio Code. So right here, you can see there's a little button um, called GitHub Copilot Chat. And here we can chat with the AI just the same way as we can with ChatGPT. Um, and the, the system is integrated directly into our code. So as we're editing code, it can make suggestions that are based on the AI. So in this case, let's go ahead and give this a try and explain to the AI what we need. Okay, so now I've explained the setup of our animation system and the names of the animations and the parameters and asked it to come up with some code for us. And so it's done, it's kind of gone through some of those requirements that I asked for and uh, wrote the, the steps that it would need. And then it's gone ahead and created the actual code. Now, uh, in this case, what it's done is again, it's actually taken all of our original code. I didn't have to copy and paste anything because it knows that we're referring to the code that is um, on the currently open script. Now, um, it's given us the whole class here pretty much. Um, but this isn't everything. Um, so it's actually skipped out some information that's not relevant necessarily or things that you don't need to change. Um, so what it's done is given it comments on areas where we should change the code. So let's go ahead and just change those spots. Uh, we can't just copy and paste everything uh, over the original because not everything has been changed. Okay, so we need to reference to this animator. So it's just to put this in here. We don't need that comment anymore. Um, current vertical angle, we have that. Um, and we have last throw time, so that has not changed. Now we do need to get the animator reference. So we will put that code in, see what else. The update function has not changed here. And then the throw function. So add these two lines, it looks like. And then we have one more function here that we can just copy and paste in that entire thing. Now there is an error here. So we've got a uh, missing I enumerator reference. So we can actually click on this um, quick fix. And this is just a normal part of Visual Studio. Um, if it has a solution for something, it'll add it. And to uh, add these using statements. So we just clicked on that. It added this using statement up here. And that means we're now able to use this special code. Okay, so that's in there. Let's take a look and see if the animation actually plays. Great, so now that's compiled. And if we load up the game, there you go. So now he's playing his throwing animation. So that was one small thing that we could add in. Next, let's expand on the wall generation of the, um, the sort of the Snowfort procedural generation script that we have and allow it to add depth as well. So for that, we might as well open up our 
ChatGPT and open up our previous chat um, that created the wall. Uh, this is the one that generated our wall right here. And we're gonna actually ask it to expand on the script a little bit so that we can have walls of uh, varying depth. So I just explained um, to add depth to actual wall generator. Let's see what it comes up with. So what it's done is, again, it's gone ahead and rewritten the entire script for us. This will make it easy to copy and paste this. Let's take a peek at how this looks. So we open up our wall generator script. And we get rid of this chat here. Now we will replace this with our new script. Save that. And let's take a look. Here's our existing wall generator that we already have. Now we have a position for a depth uh, value. So let's just do a depth of two. We don't need it to be that thick. And let's just see if it actually works. Okay. So if we take a look here, and we can see it is in fact a depth of two. So now we have an extra thick wall, which is a lot harder to knock over as the snowman. Okay, but of course every fortress wall needs a bit of crenellations at the top. So that's like the part of the castle up here, um, like this. Let's see if we can ask the AI to generate this type of thing. So to do that, uh, what we want to do is maybe give them a little bit of an example. Um, let's go ahead and put our wall back up here. And what we can do is give a little bit of a visual indicator of how we want this to look. So let's go ahead and we'll pause the simulation so that we make sure that we don't interfere with anything. We're going to duplicate all of these blocks and we're going to raise these ones up above. So that now gives us that kind of granulations look. Um, let's go ahead and just take a screenshot of that. Okay. And then we can give that to ChatGPT and explain what we want. Oh, and I've forgotten to paste in the screenshot. So actually, let's go ahead and just add in that screenshot now. It shouldn't affect the AI generation too much. Oops. Here's the screenshot. Okay. Uh, the cool thing is you can always stop a generation that's in progress and kind of inter interrupt it. And one thing I also asked is for the ability for us to use different types of blocks for these crenellation blocks. In case, let's say we want to come up with some other blocks, use smaller ones or fancy ones or something different up here. This gives us more flexibility. Okay, that's created the script. It's pretty much the same as before. We'll just copy that script over and paste it over top of our original. Let's go back to Unity. Let's take a look at our wall generator. Okay, so we want to add crenellations, yes. And for now, let's just use the same type of block. To make sure this works. Uh, we don't need two rows. Okay, uh, it doesn't seem like it's actually done this. So let's take a look and ask uh, for a little bit more details. Uh, let the AI know that this didn't work and see if it can find the issue. Sometimes it's a good idea to ask it to double check its code and to review what um, what is happening. The issue might be related to the placement condition within the loop. Okay, let's see if this code is actually any different. Okay, so taking a quick look at the code, it uh, even the, the code that it's updated us with here, it looks like, yeah, it's going to use these crenellation blocks um, in the proper spots but it's still not skipping any code, any blocks. So I just got, went ahead and actually uh, let it know that we want to skip every alternate block on the top row. Okay, cool. So it looks like we've got that working. Um, but one thing is that the crenellations are now uh, on both parts of the depth. Um, so we do want these to just be on the outermost wall. Uh, let's go ahead and explain that. Okay, so now I've tried to explain that we only want it on the first uh, depth. So that would be the first um, set of blocks. Uh, but the other parts, uh, anything deeper, should skip that final row. So let's take a look now. Let's replace this whole generate function. And go back to Unity. Okay, perfect. So now we've got crenellations on the outside and the inside we've got an actual uh, regular wall. 
Let's see if this works with other depths and sizes as well. So I want to kind of double check that this code is working well. Let's do, um, I'm going to do, maybe not, the wall doesn't have to be as big. And let's do 11 columns so that it's a little bit more of an even look. Cool. Okay. That's great. And all the other parts of the wall, the depth kind of has worked very nice. And we can, of course, destroy all of this as before. Now, the crenellations, uh, since we are able to use a different block for those, let's test that part out. Let's make ourselves a smaller uh, version of the block uh, so it's not the same size as all the, the, the regular blocks and see if we can use that for the crenellations. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, create a variant of this prefab. So if I right click and create a prefab variant, so it's going to be a snow block small. And what that means is it's going to be tied to this original slope snow block. So instead of making a duplicate of it, this is now linked together. So if I make changes to this original snow block prefab, those changes will be replicated within the variant unless I change something in the variant. So for example, if I change the size of the variant, that means that that will no longer be overridden. So let's do that. Let's bring our original snow block in the scene here so we can take a look at it. Okay. And then we're going to take our small one and put that right next to it. So we can take a look. And now the small snow block, what we want to do is reduce the size. Let's do 0.5 scale. We also don't need the health to be as high. We can do just one. So these smaller ones, you can see now, it's uh, half the size of the original block. Okay, so we're going to get rid of these two. And let's assign that to our actual crenellation. Take a look, see if that works. Okay, cool. So now our little crenellation, our little tiny blocks, <laughs> are placed on top of the other ones. So with this, actually, um, if we wanted to keep it this way, what we could do is... Um, not skip every block, but um, put one of these small ones for every single wall piece. But again, that's something that we could configure. But for now, let's go ahead and put back our old one. I think that looks a little bit better, a regular snow block. The other thing is when the snow blocks get destroyed, there's no effect to them. So let's go ahead and add a nice uh, particle effect when the snow blocks get destroyed. Uh, we're going to ask the AI how to do that, but in the meantime, I've also actually already imported in a particle effect that we're using in Snowforgers 2, so we have something to work with. Okay, so it started generating that for us. That we need a particle effect prefab, which we've already got, and we're going to instantiate it over here. Okay, great, so it looks like a destruction effect. Now, one thing I noticed is it just goes ahead and tries to instantiate it, but um, kind of a good practice is to make sure that we're checking to see if we actually have an effect because maybe not all blocks will have this effect. So let's just update the AI on that. So let's go back to our script. Let's go ahead and put that in. So here's a reference to our destruction effect. And if the health is less than zero, we're going to instantiate the destruction effect. Okay, let's take a look at that. We will let that compile. Let's just see if there's any other instructions here we need. When it reaches zero, it'll instantiate the effect. If you want the particle to destroy itself after playing, make sure the particle system as a prefab has a stop action set to destroy in its main module or add a script that calls that. Okay, let's see if we can set that as well because that'll be important. So here's our particle effect. And we want to adjust the stop effect here. Stop action. Okay, destroy. There we go. So here's our snow block. It's got a space now for destruction effect, so we can drag that in. We can see how that works. Cool. Well, visually, that looks a lot better than before. Let's see if all those particles were actually destroyed. Yes, they are. So that's fantastic. That takes care of itself. We don't have to worry about those particles. Okay, great. So what we'd like to do next is let's add some enemies, um, something throwing snowballs at our player so that there's a little bit more of a threat um, from the game. Uh, so as we go through to de destroying the uh, forts, we'll have to also dodge snowballs and uh, get health for our player. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is ask the AI to create um, an 
enemy throwing script or sort of an enemy uh, script. Let's go back to ChatGPT. And so this part is going to be a little bit more complicated. Uh, because the we are using the physics system, we're going to need to create a way for um, these snowballs to be launched with force and to be for the force and the direction and everything to be calculated so that it hits where our snowman is, where our player is. Um, so that we have first a way to hit exactly and then later we can add some offsets and some randomization to uh, change to just sort of the difficulty level. Um, but this part is a little bit complex because anything that involves a lot of complex math, creating kind of complex, more complex algorithms, is a little bit harder for the AI to do. If you just ask for an aiming script, it'll probably just have something that fires directly at the direction of your snowman or of your current of your player, but it won't have the correct, it won't calculate the correct force for the based on the mass of the snowball and the resistance and all that stuff. So for this, you need to explain it pretty clearly. So let's go ahead and uh, what we're going to do is explain kind of the full details of what we're going to be looking for. So I'm just going to copy and paste a little bit of what we've previously used just to give an idea of the uh, game that we're working on. And then the rest, let's add in the part about the enemies. So for clarity, what I'm going to do is just read this out so that you can see what this type of prompt looks like. It's quite long and um, quite detailed. When you're kind of writing prompts like this to try to get a complex idea across to the AI, and have it really understand this well. Uh, think of it as writing an email or a task for a programmer who is, you don't get to talk to in person, someone who's overseas or something, and maybe someone also whose English isn't perfect. So you really have to explain things very clearly. It does take a little bit longer to kind of put in all these details, but the more clarity you give, the more that you put emphasis on the parts that are gonna be important for the prompt and for what you wanna get back, the better the result will be. So I've got the introduction, I'm creating a PC game where the player controls a snowman in a winter setting. The player can move a snowman in a third person perspective and fire snowballs at the world. Uh, the goal is to destroy enemy forts. I would like to create an enemy that can target the player with snowballs. Snowballs are physics spheres with rigid bodies. So it's important to explain that the, we're using physics here. When the player fires them, they add force to the snowball to fire it. So we're explaining the way that we're currently using snowballs. As the player can also throw snowballs, we currently use layers to control what the snowballs interact with. Just as sort of a reference, for now, the enemy can just be a game object that spawns snowballs and throws them at the player's position. I've attached my current snowman and snowball scripts as a reference. So um, we don't want to put too much into this all at once, um, into this prompt. So, you know, if we're asking for to create an entire enemy, that's going to be really complicated because there may be movement involved. There may be other stats of the enemy, like health and things like this, that it's going to try to take into account. And it's way too much complication for uh, for what we want to do right now. All we're concerned with is being able to throw snowballs and hit a specific position. So please take into account the physics so that the snowball that the enemy throws will always hit the player if the player doesn't move. So we again emphasize that we're going to be using physics here. This means that you should use force, which will which you will have to calculate to hit a specific world position of the player and take into account the gravity and other rigid body settings of the snowball. We don't need to predict the player position at this point. So just clarifying that we want to keep it simple. We don't want to add too much right now. So there we go. Now we've got our um, scripts in here. It's going to generate the code for us. So what it's done nicely is it's kind of outlined what needs to be done. It's gone through our scripts, analyzed them, and it's created this step-by-step -step approach, which helps the AI think about the process as it's kind of going through this. The really uh, the good thing about this is that um, it really gives itself more context. Because the AI doesn't have any capacity to think in the background, it really only thinks word by word as it's writing the word. It doesn't reflect back onto the, the concept or on back onto anything. So in order for it to kind of have more of a thought process of itself, it needs to think aloud. And that's when uh, doing this sort of step-by-step -step approach is really great when it does that. You can also prompt it and ask it to do that step-by-step -step approach and or to write out the steps before you create the script. You can say that kind of thing, and that will help it kind of go through the thoughts that it has, if you would call them that, um, out loud and write them all out. And then it can reference those thoughts as it's writing the code later on. So here's the code that it's created. 
So we're gonna go ahead and copy that over. Uh, let's see here. So let's explain what it's done with the code and uh, explain the player, all the kind of parts of the code. So remember to attach the script to an enemy game object, assign the player and a snowball prefab in the inspector, adjust the initial speed as we need to match game dynamics. Okay, cool. Let's go back to Unity. We're gonna go ahead and create a new script, C Sharp script. So there's our new empty script. We'll go ahead and open that up in our script editor. We'll replace the placeholder code with our ChatGPT code. Save that. Let's go back to Unity, recompile that. And what we need to do is now attach this script to an enemy. Now we don't really have an enemy yet. So what we'll just do is create something temporary for now. So let's just create ourselves a little capsule. Just gonna be our, our enemy, let's say, a little bit in the distance. Okay, so there's our enemy. Um, we don't need a collider on it right now. It's just a placeholder. And let's add our actual enemy thrower script here. Uh, now it wants us to assign the player um, in the inspector, which is not really great because you don't want to be able to manually have to assign the actual player to each enemy, right? especially if enemies are being spawned, you can't really do that before you actually play the game. So uh, we're gonna need to ask it to change that. But for now, let's just see if this works. So we'll go ahead and drag in our player and then a snowball prefab. So what does it wanna use? We'll go ahead and grab our snowball, put that in here, initial speed, we'll leave that at the default. And let's take a look at what it does. Okay, well, <laughs> it's created a bit of a machine gun of snowballs, but it is correctly calculating the position. So if I stop the snowman, it looks like he's being hit at any position. If I go behind the enemy, he's always aiming at me. Okay, cool. Well, this is partially working, but we've got some things to adjust. So we can go back to the AI and let's explain what we want to change. Okay, so what I've explained here is for it to adjust two things in the script. One, for it to be able to find the player, so we don't want to have to assign it manually in the inspector. And two, let's add a delay between the snowballs, so it's not firing one every single frame. Okay, so hopefully it understood that. Um, so it's going to find the player automatically. It's going to use the tag, uh, game object find with tag. Okay, uh, so make sure to tag your player game object in the Unity editor. And then it looks like the tag we want to add is going to be player. Yes, that's right. So while it's generating the script, we can just do that quickly. We will go to our actual snowman prefab, take a look, and it looks like we've already tagged him to player. So that's okay, good to go. Let's go back to ChatGPT and then add a delay between snowballs. So it's gonna go ahead and try to add that. So it's created a throw timer, okay, and a throw delay variable. So I've gone ahead and pasted the new code it looks like it's going to try to find the player it's itself. It even put in a debug message and error check here, which is really great programming to make sure you put in a check for something that you're expecting to find. Um, the fact that it's writing out player uh, as a kind of a magic string here, um, instead of using a variable for this is not great. Let's go back to Unity. Okay, and it looks like on our enemy here, we've got ourselves our throw delay. So theoretically, every second it should throw one snowball at us. Let's take a look. One, three, four, five, six. Okay, cool. Looks like it's throwing snowballs at our exact position. Okay, and we can adjust the velocity of these snowballs, the initial speed. So let's say we want to change this to a little bit slower. So the snowballs are a little bit more dodgeable. That's cool. Maybe 10 is not a bad value, actually. And of course, this is we can change this based on the type of enemy. So some can fire faster, some can fire more rapidly. Let's say we put on a, only a 0.2 second delay, so we can do a kind of a fire. Okay, fantastic. So now we've got a pretty good little enemy system, uh, at least for throwing snowballs. Let's go ahead and add some health to our player uh, so that he can take damage from the snowballs. And since it already has a reference to our existing code here, hopefully you can still remember that, we will ask it to create a health script uh, or health system for our player to be able to take damage. Now to do this, we wanna make sure that it's also setting the correct uh, layer for the snowball. So we'll have to reiterate that. So I've described that we wanna add a health system. So we wanna create a new script for that. 
and uh, that we want to be damaged by the snowball, and that explain the details about the snowball and the layers uh, that the snowman and snowball layer currently do not interact with each other. So we want to make sure we change the snowball layer as it's fired. So it's written out some details here. Um, modify the enemy snowball script, create a that snowball thrower script, create a player health script to uh, give the health, and then adjust the snowball script as well. All right, so we've got a brand new player health script. Let's go ahead and copy that over. We'll create a new script in Unity. Replace the default with our code here. So it looks like it's got a, itself a health and a take damage. That's gonna take damage from snowballs, hopefully. And then if the damage gets below, the health gets below zero, it will die. So nothing really happens for this right now, but just prints a message, uh, which is a good start. Let's go ahead and see what other changes we need to do. So next, modify the enemy snowball thrower. So the launch snowball at player function specifically. Launch snowball at player. Okay. And this is going to change the layer now. Make sure to set the Unity settings to adjust the, the layer, collision layers, okay. So it looks like it's got just none, no real good layer here. So let's put in, let's make a new layer that will be enemy snowball. What we'll do is copy that, make sure that in Unity we have the same layer. So we'll go to our layers control here and edit layers. And we've got enemy snowball, okay, great. Now I want to make sure that that layer, public settings, physics, that the enemy snowball collides with the snowman, which is our player. Perfect. Okay. Let's see what else we need to change. And then our snowball script. Looks like it wants to make some changes here. So compare the tag for the player and then take damage. Okay. So there's our old snowball script. And we're going to paste in our new code. Okay, so that's great. Let's go ahead and test this out. Uh, so next, we will also need to make sure we add our player health script to our player and make sure that it's added to the actual prefab. Okay, so he's being hit and even pushed back slightly, which is cute. Let's see if our health is gonna be changing. So we're only showing our max health here. Um, so we're going to have to wait until we get hit by 10 snowballs, I guess, before we see the uh, message that we're dead. And there we go. Player died. Okay. So uh, it looks like we're kind of hit sometimes, but not every time. I think the snowballs are falling a little short of our snowmen. Yeah, it looks like they're aiming for the origin point of, the, of our snowman, or the pivot point which is a little bit under the ground. So as you can see, the snowballs are sort of getting, um, hitting down below a little bit. So not every snowball is actually hitting. We should offset the aim so it's up a little higher. Okay, cool. So this is good. Let's go ahead and just update the AI about this. Okay, so we're gonna wanna adjust the enemy aim to have a vertical offset. Um, so that he aims a little bit higher, uh, the enemy at our snowman. And then after we've got this working, um, let's also add a little bit of a distance check so that the enemy uh, range is limited. Um, and then we can start to add in things like um, a user interface to be able to show our actual uh, snowman health. Okay, vertical offset for aiming, so we've got that. Enemy snowball thrower script, let's just add that. We don't need to replace the entire script. Vertical offset is added to the player's Y coordinate before calculating the launch velocity. Okay, we should probably update this, this entire function. Okay, and then let's go back to Unity. Okay, so what's this vertical offset set to by default? It's one. All right, let's take a look at that. So that should be almost the height of our snowman. He's a little bit taller than one, I believe. Well, maybe it's a little too high. <laughs> Looks like it's hitting his hat. All right, let's do 0.5. Okay, it looks like the offset is correct. The snowballs are going through our snowman here. 
Let's take a look. It's possible we might have removed some of the script. Yeah, we looks like we unfortunately removed the code that changed the layer. Let's go ahead and just undo that, and then we can just copy over our specific line here. Ah, uh, yes, okay, we're missing this line. So let's copy only what we need. Let's go back to Unity and see if that works. So this is kind of showing one of the potential issues with um, with some of the AI is when it replaces the functions. It didn't even take into account its previous change that it made to this function with the layers. This is something to watch out for and realize that it could be working still with a previous version that it had created instead of with the most recent. Okay, let's run that. Okay, great. Now he's being hit right in the face with snowballs. <laughs> Let's go back to AI and add in a distance check. And I'm also going to make sure to point out the issue that it had created with the code that didn't, um, uh, that wasn't correctly updated. So we're just going to provide it with this updated script here. So what I've done is I've updated the AI with the um, new function here so that it's going to have that as a reference, hopefully. And then I've also asked it to create a distance check for the snowballs. So it's going to do a max throw range variable. Um, and it's got some instructions on changing this. So here's this new variable it's added. Okay. And what else? So it looks like we just compare our code. We've got this little distance check here. And one thing I don't really like that it's put in is it's put this right into the main part of the update function. So it means every frame this distance is going to be calculated, which is really not the best place for this because we don't need to check the distance if, for example, we're not going to be throwing a snowball anyway. And this is just wasting uh, processing power. Um, also, a distance check is a little bit more of a computationally intensive calculation. So we don't want those to be inside update running every frame. Uh, it's a very simple fix to that. Um, let's move this right here. So that after, only when we're about to throw. So when our throw timer is beyond our throw delay, then we'll check the distance. Um, and then if it's not within the right range, we will not fire the snowball because we'll just return out of this function. So let's save that. Let's take a look at this and see how it works. So to make this a little bit easier to check, what we're going to do is let's just change the max throw range to 10 so we don't have to get so far away. So it looks like it's not throwing, so we're probably more than 10 units away. And then as soon as we move closer, it starts to throw snowballs at us. Okay, and then we move away. It's out of range. We can still throw snowballs, but it cannot. Let's add some UI so that we can see our health um, to see if we're taking damage. So I just explained this is a pretty simple thing just to add some UI to show our health. We already have a cart icon in the game, um, so we can just use that. And I've asked it to give me instructions on how to set all of this up, how to set up the UI canvas and everything. Um, and this is something that comes with some sort of experience to be able to uh, how to set up UIs. There's lots of different ways, lots of different practices um, for setting up UIs. There's more complicated approaches that create better um, UI code and more efficient code. And, and uh, there's also new UI systems. There's a bunch of UI packages you can get from the asset store. Um, so really the UI is, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. If you have a specific idea for how you want to implement your UI, it's best to describe that. But for now, we're going to keep this simple and just let it come up with some very basic UI for us. So while it's generating this, let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to add a canvas and canvas settings. We want to set it to screen space overlay. So it renders over top of everything. OK, let's do that. Save our scene here. And then we're going to create UI canvas. All right, so we've got our canvas here. We're going to set that to screen space overlay. OK, it looks like it's already at that. Add heart icon, right click on the canvas, add UI image, creates a UI image, name it heart icon, set the icon selected. You can set the inspector to the source image, duplicate for multiple hearts. If you want five hearts for full health, you can duplicate this. 
So this is a very basic way of setting this up. Uh, one thing I'm gonna adjust here, I prefer this scale with screen size setting in the UI. They are kind of all work in different ways based on what devices you're targeting for. Um, but I'm gonna just set it to this one. And we're gonna assume a uh, kind of average screen. And we're gonna put that in five. And just to organize these parts, because we're going to want to have some other UI elements in here, let's just put in a, a separate sub-object here. It's going to be our health. Let's adjust this so that our UI is going to, our health is going to show up in a specific part of the screen. So um, we can put that in at our, um, let's say, the top of the screen here. And then the width. Maybe now an easier way to work with UI because right now we can't see anything here. Let's go to our actual UI. This is showing our what our UI canvas looks like now based on the screen size. So as we make the screen wider, the UI canvas gets adjusted as well. And then here's our health section is going to be this little square part right here. And in that we're going to want to create a UI image part. And let's find our heart here. And we've got a bunch of UI elements that I brought over from Snow Fortress 2. Uh, what we're gonna do is just assign all of these as sprites. So they are all set up for UI. Save that. Let's assign our heart. There we go, we got ourselves a heart. It's kind of huge. So we don't need it to be that big. Uh, what we can do is um, adjust the heart itself, or we can adjust the health section. So let's put this at maybe 60 height. In the heart, we want it to fill vertically. There we go. We want it to maintain its aspect ratio so that it won't get squished. And let's make our heart red. Okay, so we've got a cute little heart there. And it's a little bit close to the top of the screen, so let's move that section down by, say, 20. Okay, so we've got a heart duplicate for multiple hearts, so let's give ourselves three hearts. Now, one way to organize these nicely is to put these inside of an actual uh, layout group. So what I'll do is I'll just add that now. Horizontal layout group, control child size, we want the heart, and we want these to be center aligned. Okay, so now I've got our hearts there. There's uh, some space between them uh, because they're spaced out sort of evenly. Um, so maybe that's a little bit too much space between them. Let's go ahead and reduce this heart area. Make the width 200 maybe. That's a little bit better. Okay, so we've got our three hearts set up here. Now let's go to our code. So we're gonna wanna create a health UI script. Okay, let's do that. And create a health UI manager, create an empty game object under the canvas, call it the health UI manager, attach the script health UI, assign references to the player and the heart icons, and we're gonna test it. All right, let's take a look. Health. UI, open that up, paste in our script here. And it looks like what it's gonna to wanna to do is actually create the hearts uh, based on a little heart prefab. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, and we have a inconsistent reference here between a float and an int because our health is a float type and um, an array is expecting an int type. So we can just easily convert that to int. Got an error here. Let's ask the AI about this error. Okay, so it's found the issue with that, and we need to be able to publicly access the player health. So what it's done is it's asked us to add this piece of code, public property to expose current health. Paste that in, and this will allow other scripts to be able to view what our current health is. Now, as we've got a health of 100, that means it's gonna create 100 hearts for us. Um, that's, that's may not be <laughs> what we want to do. 
let's um, see if we can standardize kind of the health because we've got different health for the snowman. Uh, we've got different health for blocks and things like that. So let's just uh, set all that up so it's the same. Okay, we'll just make sure that script is okay. Looks like our error is gone. We can add our health UI script. So it wants to reference our player in here. And then we need a prefab for the hearts. So let's see if it's got some instructions on what we need to do to create that. Okay, so we've set up, create the icon, duplicate for multiple hearts, create a help heart UI script, and create a health UI manager, assign a script, assign references, um, and heart icon as the heart prefab. Okay, so we need to make a new prefab. I'm gonna make a folder for UI prefabs because we may get additional ones here. We'll bring in one of our hearts into this as a heart prefab. So we no longer need these placeholder hearts here because they're going to be created based on what our health is. Let's change our player health. So it is three. That means we can take three hits. And let's change how much damage snowballs do. So we'll go back to our snowball. Change that so it does one damage. And we'll change our snow blocks to make sure that they have health. Okay, looks like health of three, so that also is appropriate. Okay, let's test this out. Ah, looks like we've got some sort of errors here. Let's take a look here. And this, ah, we never assigned the hard prefab. Okay, so let's put that in. I'm just going to call this heart icon to make it clearer. Okay, we've got our three hearts because we've got three health. Well, cool. now if we take some damage, two hearts, one heart, and oh, we're dead. So we'll end it off for now. That's a couple of new features that we've added into this episode. And uh, next time we'll add in the ability to be able to destroy the enemies. We'll add in some types of actual enemies. And we'll start to put some of these features together so that we actually have a bit of a mission to destroy some blocks bypass some enemies and get to some location. So thanks again for watching. Don't forget to check out Snow Fortress 2, which is our VR game that was recently released for Steam VR, Pico, and Quest platforms, where you get to build your own snow fort in VR and defend it from these very snowmen. And remember, if you like this series and you want to see more episodes about how to use AI and Unity development in general, then please subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so that you will know when new episodes come out. Thanks so much, and I will see you in the next episode.